Hi, I'm Max Kaiser. This is the Kaiser Report. You know, globalization has allowed for the worst practices of various countries to become the global standard. For example, Stacey Herbert. <laughs> Max Kaiser, are you talking about gangsterism? I notice you're actually looking like a modern day gangster. Apparently, old style gangsters handing out cash in bars and pool halls have been replaced by apparently respectable bankers, lawyers, or notaries. According to a new report in Italy, Mafia now Italy's number one bank as crisis bites report. Organized crime now generates annual turnover of about 140 billion euros and profits of more than 100 billion euros, which is 7% of GDP. And the report says with 65 billion euros in liquidity, the mafia is Italy's number one bank. Everybody wants to be like Jamie, spaghetti nose diamond. <laughs> or Lloyd, Mfunguza Gaza, <laughs> Black Fine. You know, it's the global aspiration to be a gangster on a Wall Street, make predatory loans and extort money. But of course, you know, they just borrowed it from the good guys, the wise guys and the mafia. They picked it up in the predatory loan sector on Wall Street. And now they're just re doing the reciprocation. Now we're seeing they're picking up what the Wall Street and the city bankers do by legitimizing predatory loans, loan sharking, payday loans, leg breaking. Citibank, of course, last year, remember, uh, one of their Chinese debt collectors actually broke somebody's leg to pick up a loan. So, hey, it's beautiful, man. It's a Martin Scorsese film waiting to happen. Well, many media have been reporting on this report out of Italy, and the Telegraph writes that organized crime groups had been able to expand their territory into the wealthy north through the complicity of some politicians, as well as professionals, such as lawyers and accountants. Well, this guy, Mario Monti, who's now running Italy, uh, he's uh, a leg breaker with ties to Goldman Sachs. He goes back years already. So he's a decapo decapo. You know, he's, of course, he's asking the Gomorrah and the Cosa Nostra from the South to come on up north, baby. We got a lot of people here you can financially rape with your predatory loans, Mario Monti says, the three card Monti. The Gomorrah? You mean the Gomorrah? <laughs> yeah. Or is that a coffee creamer? <laughs> I'm thinking of the coffee creamer. I can't get my head away from that great Italian espresso. The best espresso in the world, in my opinion. Yeah, but like I said, you know, they, these are politicians, professionals, lawyers, and accountants aiding and abetting them. So what's the difference between one guy who's a, they say is mafia, and the likes of Mario Monti, who is appointed, he's thrust onto the population, unelected, and he dictates to them what they can and cannot spend, and controls their financial system, controls their liquidity, controls the same thing that the mafia is doing. Well, I mean, the mafia calls it the black market, and the bankers call it the shadow banking system. They each have their dark exchanges and their under the table, underhanded black hand of financial rape that they make huge profits on, whether it's the banks on Wall Street in the city of London or the mafia in Italy or elsewhere around the world. They're all adopting each other's business model because it's highly profitable and there's no regulations. There are no, there's no crime busters in Italy breaking up the mafia. They're just like there's no regulators in the US or the city of London breaking up the money launderers and the financial terrorist rings in those cities. The article says, as I said, old style gangsters are no longer there. They look like professionals. They are bankers, they're lawyers, they're accountants. They operate in the guise of that. They call it, this is extortion with a clean face. Through their professions, they know the mechanisms of the legal credit market, and they often know the financial position of their victims perfectly. Well, look, the, the basic rule of thumb, whether in the mafia or on Wall Street, is that for every billion in loans you create, you get a million dollar bonus. That's the VIG. So you think about it this way. America's got 15 trillion in debt. That created 15 billion in bonuses on Wall Street. There are hundreds of trillions of dollars worth of derivatives or debts or loans in the system. What was last year's bonus pool on Wall Street? 150 billion. So that's the rule of thumb. Whether you're Joey Spaghetti Diamond on mafioso land in Naples, or whether you're on Wall Street, the more debt you create, the more predatory loans you create, the bigger your bonus. It's uh, in every, any Goomba can figure that out. 
Well, the article does mention that most of the victims of these mafia are small and middle-sized businesses. So I want to cut to the United States and their mafia rackets. Farmers sue John Corzine over missing millions. Montana farmers have filed a class action suit against former New Jersey Governor John Corzine, charging that the failed financial firm run by Corzine stole millions from their accounts to pay off its spiraling debts, and that Corzine's single-minded obsession with making MF Global a big player on Wall Street led to the firm's collapse. So this is 38,000 wheat farmers, cattle ranchers, and others who had hedged their crop prices. Wheat farmers? You know, that could cut into your pizza production and your spaghetti. Okay, be careful about this one because you might run out of pasta fazool for your annual Predator's Ball. But, you know, Corzine is, of course, the Joe Pesci in this situation. Except in this movie, he gets made. Remember, I think it's in Goodfellas, Joe Pesci doesn't get made, and then he gets whacked. Here, Corzine gets made, he commits fraud, he and J.P. Morgan steal from their own customers, and he gets an office down on Wall Street advising new clients and making more bonus pools, so he got made. Well, let's listen again to the description of John Corzine. Former New Jersey governor, former CEO of Goldman Sachs, and go back to the Mafia in Italy story, old style gangsters handing out cash in bars and pool halls have been replaced by apparently respectable bankers, lawyers, or notaries. So what's the difference? No difference. And of course, uh, John Corzine, former governor of New Jersey, home of Tony Soprano, <laughs> he's down there at the garbage dump. Hey, you see John Corzine at the bada bing, <laughs> arranging a multi-billion dollar loan for some wheat farmers. He's going to bankrupt and take all their pasta. Thanks, John Corzine, made mafioso. I will add this suit by 38,000 farmers and ranchers also names PricewaterhouseCoopers and J.P. Morgan Chase. Remember PricewaterhouseCoopers, they're accountants. So again, the mafia in Italy operates as accountants as well. Just get a rubber stamp with PricewaterhouseCoopers, KPMG, J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs, and just stamp a bunch of paper, stamp a bunch of paper, lawsuit, 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 and throw it in the garbage. Doesn't matter because once you're a made man in this mafia environment, you can't do no wrong. The only thing that happened is you get whacked. Let's move on to further headlines regarding the U.S. Mafia. Bill Black, more proof of Obama policy of covering up for elite financial criminals. So this is Bill Black responding to a November 22nd, 2011 New York Times piece by Gretchen Morganson and Louise Story. And he's waited all this time to respond because he is so shocked at the allegations made by them that he was waiting for the Obama administration to respond. And basically what they said is that they talked to some longtime lawyers who say the overall scarcity of cases related to the financial crisis might be in part because regulators want to avoid scrutiny of their own kind. So they talked to some lawyers who were involved, in, like a former New York State Attorney General, Dennis C. Vacco, for example, and he says that it's not just one 30-year-old wonderkind who was responsible for the financial crisis. Once you start pulling the string through in these complex cases, you might be surprised what you find at the other end. And what you find is the government and their financial regulators and institutions that they were just as much involved in the corruption and the mortgage fraud. That's right. <laughs> of course, the government is involved. Of course, the great intermediating force, the interface between government's involvement in extortion and the rackets and the markets per se, are Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the government-sponsored entities that they created to artificially suppress interest rates, to give artificially large bonuses to incredibly gifted charlatans and thieves. And that's the interface between government. And that's you know, where you find the incredible uh, collection of mortgage fraud and the subprime crisis building up like an enormous zit on the face of um, the American economy that popped in 2007 and splued white pus into, into the faces of 300 million Americans. And they're trying to desperately clean that off their face. They're like, Obama, how come you don't help us? And Obama's out there for... <laughs> well, Bill Black says that these charges are exceptionally severe. The fact that Obama has no response rebutting this grave charge against his administration's integrity sounds loud, but not proud. In fact, he's doubled down, Max, because here's the next headline. New chief of staff, former hedge fund exec at Citigroup, made money off mortgage defaults. So 
Citigroup, of course, is basically another government-sponsored entity. It operated as a private company listed on the public markets, but it's always been backed by the U.S. government, essentially. But from 2006 to 2008, Jack Lew, Obama's new chief of staff, was chief operating officer of Citibank's Alternative Investments Division, who made billions on John Paulson betting against the subprime mortgage market. And after Citigroup was bailed out by the government to the tune of, what, $45 billion, he collected a bonus of $900,000 after they became publicly owned. Right. Uh, Jack uh, Spumoni Lou, <laughs> one of the gangsters, Citigroup, uh, they traded on inside information uh, to uh, make incredible profits. Now they've used that money that they made on trading on inside information, market manipulation, documented many times. This is not a, a secret. They're using the profits to uh, buy their way into government to become essentially Obama's what? But this Jack Lew has been in government and then he went to Citigroup. Then he was back in government. He has a long career of going back and forth. He's got a pretty senior position now, right? What's his, what's his position now? Uh, chief of staff for yeah. the Obama well, That costs a lot of money. You got to rape a lot of people to get a lot of money. You got to shake down a lot of people. Yeah, you got to shake down millions of mortgage holders to become chief of staff. And you know how mafia, how you move up the ranks, you commit more and more crimes, you impress the boss. So here's what Glenn Greenwald says about this story. He said, the 2008 financial crisis is the new Iraq war. It does not matter how prominent a role someone played in enabling it or how much they profited from it or how Essentially, they were part of the corrupted machinery that brought it about. If they have the right ideology and good standing in Washington circles, all is forgiven and they do not suffer any consequences at all, even reputationally. Indeed, not only is it no impediment to their achievement, but it's actually an asset. Yeah, to get the initiation, right, to get into this mob is you got to kill a few million homeowners. <laughs> That's just the, initi the initiation fee. And then from there to rise up the ranks of the mafia to get close to Obama. The, the, the spaghetti monster in chief, you know, you got to be able to, the, the meatball head on top, you got to be able to really uh, swing your big fat swinging Gonzala so that you can put the schmilmeal to about another 20 million people. So they're on the street begging, you know, picking seeds out of the fecal matter of their pet dogs trying to stay alive. That's how you become big in government in America. Now they got this private equity bum. You know, this guy, Rit, Rom, 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 Mitt Romney, who's from Bain Capital. What is, the, all they do is they just uh, rape and pillage and steal 24 hours a day. So of course he's up, up in the mafia model. He's gonna be the presidential contender. Stacey Herbert, thanks so much for being on the Kaiser Report. Thank you, Max. Don't go away, much more coming away, so stay right there. Hi, I'm Max Kaiser. Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. Time now to go to Colorado and talk with investment advisor Michael Krieger. Michael's writings can be found at zerohedge.com. Michael, welcome back to the Kaiser Report. Uh, thanks for having me, Max. Great to be back. All right, Michael Krieger, you have dedicated yourself to campaigning for Ron Paul. Tell us why. At this point, I have. And, you know, as you know, as things have sort of progressed in this uh, sort of awakening or, or global uprising against the, uh, the current status quo, um, there are different battles, I think, that are, that are necessary to fight at different times. And, you know, both of us have, have done the silver fight, and I think that's still something that's extremely important. But I do think that as 2012 is here and the charade of Democrats versus Republicans, red versus blue, um, let's not talk about any real issues and debate non-issues and get people all riled up about emotional side issues. Um, I think that it is extremely important to sort of try to get the weight awakening in the political sphere now so that people that actually just don't have the background or time to understand the monetary system and the financial aspect of it maybe can wake up on other issues. And Ron Paul, for example, um, on the three major issues I think are of utmost importance, civil liberties, the war, uh, empire, state, and, uh, and the Federal Reserve and, and too big to fail, those are all issues that I think you can if it's not one, it's the other, connect with a, a vast majority of the American population. So that's, that's basically my goal for this year. All right, so interestingly enough, Ron Paul has attracted support from both the Tea Party and Occupy Wall Street. So there's some crossover there, correct? Absolutely, yes. I mean, there, there are certain issues that neither party is comfortable actually discussing, and so they actually don't discuss it at all. And I do think the one that uh, there are really 
of all the issues I mentioned, they're, they're all important. But the Fed is one that I think is really interesting because Republicans never really like to criticize it, yet it is the epitome of central planning. Um, it is a central bank that creates, uh, that decides at its own, you know, its own will what the price of money is. So it's, it's actually the, the most important price fixing entity in the world. And yet Republicans, you know, who claim they're for small government and free markets don't seem to attack the fact that this is the most big government institution you could ever have. And, and of course, they, they talk about independence, which is ridiculous. Um, and then on the Democratic side, the Federal Reserve is the mechanism that's used to transfer increasing amounts of wealth from the middle class and poor to the super, super, super rich. So, you know, both sides of the, of the aisle, supposedly this big divide, should be attacking the Fed, yet neither of them do. So there, there's Ron Paul that does, and that's why I think he's getting support from both sides. He's going at the root issues that no one else wants to discuss. All right, you talk about the Fed as being the ultimate in central planning and, uh, you know, borrowed from central planned governments of the past that have failed, apparently, supposedly, that America somehow triumphed against. And yet now they're, through the Federal Reserve, seem to be emulating this whole idea of central planning. And another aspect of these centrally planned governments and economies from the past was that really uh, strong propaganda mechanism. And here with Ron Paul, he comes in second uh, in a primary, and yet the mainstream media, who is, it's, very, it's quite obvious now that there's this huge propaganda element in place where they don't report. It's like watching North Korean TV when you watch CNN or Fox News. They, they simply gloss over uh, actual facts and figures, what's going on. It's quite shocking, I think, for a lot of people. What, what, what is the mainstream afraid of exactly with Ron Paul? When I think about this, you know, it's easy to go into conspiracy theories and saying that, you know, everyone on mainstream television is purposely lying or deceiving and all that. And I do think there is for sure an element of that going on um, within all of the mainstream media channels that people deliberately are deceiving the population. However, I do also think the majority of it is simply the powerful elite in this country, and that of course includes the media, um, have benefited from this warfare, welfare, Federal Reserve transfer of wealth model. So they don't even question um, the root cancer that is America at this point. And so I think there is a large element of people just not wanting to rock the boat to a system that has enriched them, um, made them celebrity, given them the lifestyle that they have. So that's really where I think people the media just tends to just block out Ron Paul because he is actually talking about structural change. And structural change, in most cases, for most of the people with a, with a voice on television, is not in their best interests. Right. So the anchors on CNN and Fox News would simply lose their job. Now, um, chief of staff for Barack Obama now is Jack Lew. He's the former COO of Citibank. Your thoughts? I actually think this is good, though, because when, when, you know, when Obama continues to expose himself as the complete fraud and bankster puppet that he is, it just brings more people to ask the questions. It's just more ammunition for our side to say, see, you know, see what he did here? You know, notice how I had a lot of friends that had said to me before the uh, NDAA that Obama said he would veto it, so he'd veto it. And I said to people, he's not going to veto it. You watch. And then when he didn't, I get credibility. So we get credibility we get further credibility with people as Obama and others in power do the opposite of what you'd think they rationally would, should do or what would be in the best interest of the people. Look, I mean, this is, this is a trend that we've seen with Obama from the beginning, which is the, the um, oligarchs in the financial services industry, which are stealing from essentially the productive parts of the American economy and, uh, and, and crashed the world economy back in 2007 and 2008 are being rewarded with positions. It's, it's, it's two plus two equals five from Orwell's 1984. It, it, all of these guys should never ever be able to have a job anywhere again. They should all be disgraced, but instead it's this religion of um, Ponzi finance and Federal Reserve dominance that we are continuing to push forward with. And Obama's a key uh, player in that. And of course, it's destroying America, I think, as most people now recognize. Well, it's a mafia model. Jack Lew has proven himself to be a killer. 
uh, of mortgages and of people's net worth. So he gets a he gets a bump up in the mafia organization. Speaking of gangsters, uh, John Corzine, another proven killer uh, from MF Global, former governor of New Jersey, ex Goldman Sachs terrorist. Uh, he's got a big uh, payday coming, I guess. Or moving him to a new office and giving him another uh, role in, in uh, ransacking the, the economy. What are your thoughts on uh, John Corsine at this juncture? Look, MF Global has been talked about to death, but I do have, you know, and I mentioned this on a TF Metals interview I did recently. Um, it was a huge deal, though, for people like me that have been sort of following the markets in the background saying, okay, well, what's their next move? When are they going to attack futures? Are, is the theft going to accelerate? The fact that John Corzine has seemingly gotten away with what he's gotten away with and the media really giving him a break and, and a lot of defense and the fact he's looking for an office, as you say, and was looking for a chateau in, in, in France. I don't know if you saw that story um, a few weeks prior to the bankruptcy of MF Global. This all further proves the, the fact that there is no rule of law in the United States. And by participating in the, let's say, casino um, of the markets, uh, you are um, risking your money in a, in a massive way. And, and I being involved in that, that bothers me. It scares me. It's, it's a big reason why I, from the beginning, did not want to uh, accept capital was because I was worried that it would go down this path. And now that it is, I'm, I'm, I'm becoming increasingly concerned just, just being involved at all um, because it's, it's, it clearly, it's clearly totally criminal. So um, that's what the MF thing said to me. That's what Corzine said to me. I knew they were going to attack fu the futures markets at some point. They've been very crafty at getting people afraid to now buy futures through this MF situation. So uh, I think we're in a whole nother ball game, a whole nother realm of, uh, of theft, manipulation and fraud in the markets. Let me get your thoughts on something. It was recently announced from the CME, C Chicago Mercantile Exchange, that they're launching Nadex, N-A-D-E-X, which gives people a chance to speculate using so-called prediction markets with real money on presidential elections and other political outcomes. So they're going to combine po politics and political outcomes, speculative betting with a futures market. I is this kind of like combining the worst of two corrupt worlds or is there something I'm missing, Mike Krieger, your thoughts? You know, you've touched on this before and I think in the, in the exact correct way. It, it reminds me a lot of like how Comex, how paper, silver and gold have been used to, you know, like the tail wagging the dog to, to keep the bigger physical market down and to manage expectations and to keep people um, thinking that things are okay. Uh, I think that this is just, this is sort of the, the idea is the rollout of this, it, it will take over polling. So polling will probably become a thing of the past, and then markets, the, the you know this sort of this sort of deity that is the markets, will then determine everything um, in society, including politics. So you have the situation where they have Mitt Romney. The paper price for Mitt Romney could be extremely high, even though the actual people voting on, on the voting booths is a different story altogether, but the paper price is at a higher level that the media then reports on as A, too big to fail, there's systemic risk and not voting for this guy, and B, the markets, which are infallible according to the neo-market religion, uh, are telling us that there's only one outcome, like this guy's gotta win, correct? Of course, and so I think what they're doing is they're just taking the model that's worked for them in the futures, you know, in the gold and silver markets and now in the stock markets, which what they're doing is they're keeping the stock markets elevated so that people don't question that things are bad. You know, oh, you know, 46 million people on food stamps, so what, the S&P is at 1280. Oh, you know, things can't be that bad. It's, it's the same thing with sort of this, what I've noticed is the meme in the mainstream media regarding Ron Paul is he's unelectable. So what they do is when they discuss Ron Paul is they just say he's unelectable. They just sort of blurt it out as if it's the sky is blue. And what ends up happening is if you say it enough, uh, eventually people will start saying it to themselves in society. It's pretty pathetic, but it's true. And then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And I've noticed that just based on people that like Ron Paul that write to me and say, I like him, but he's unelectable. And then I engage them in a debate of like, oh, well, tell me why he's unelectable. And they can't really explain it. Um, it's, it's literally this, this subliminal propaganda that emanates originally from the TV 
to the collective consciousness. And it's, and I think that's what they're going for with these, uh, with these markets. And if you can manip and we know that they can manipulate all the markets. Why? Cause they run the casino. So if they're going to run the casino of political polling or political futures markets, that's what they're going to do. They'll get out there and they'll say, they'll rig it so that Romney has 80% and then say, see, Ron Paul's unelectable, you know, game over. That's, I think that's what, where this is going. Very scary. A absolutely. I've been warning about this for years, and but uh, the only industry that's protected itself against this was Hollywood when they banned box office futures trading. And of course, uh, who wouldn't want the JFK puts in August of 1963? That would have been a winning bet for sure. All right, we're out of time. Michael Krieger, thanks so much for being on the Kaiser Report. Always great, Max. Thank you. All right, and that's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. I want to thank my guest, Michael Krieger. You can catch his stuff at zerohedge.com. If you want to send me an email, please do so at kaiserreported.rttv.ru. Until next time, Max Kaiser saying bye, y'all.